Doctor Who Flux has been marketed as the biggest story ever made. Now, I'm not one to judge, but that is a massive statement. But this story would prove to be the longest since the show's return in 2005, spanning six episodes across six weeks. A series-long story like this has not been attempted since the trial of a Time Lord. The first part of Flux which can also be seen as the first chapter, is aptly titled The Halloween Apocalypse, and it is penned by showrunner Chris Chibnall. Jodie Whittaker and Amanda Gill return as the Doctor and Yaz, and this sees the debut of new companion Dan, played by John Bishop. Right off the bat, what I will say is, it's a lot of fun from start to finish. The opening scene immediately gripped me, with the Doctor and Yaz being in danger at the hands of Carvinista, who's this new alien who by no doubt some Whovians will want to cosplay as, because he's a space dog. From the first episode alone, I have mixed feelings on Carvinista. I'm not sure if he's been played for laughs due to the look of the character and his Lancashire accent, but it will be interesting to see where the rest of the series takes us with this guy, because he could have potential to be a fan favourite. More members of his species, the Lupari, are even alluded to, so even in future episodes beyond this era, depending on fan reactions, this race could return. But maybe I'm getting ahead of myself. Carvinista and the Lupari are just a small cog in the grand scheme of things for this story, because from what I gathered from this opener, Chris Chibnall wants to create a big space epic. He is throwing everything at this, as this is his last series. There's so many plot threads which begin in here, and naturally, there's a lot of unanswered questions. After all, this is only chapter one of six. This is just setting things up. The one thing I'm reliant on is that the rest of this saga especially the conclusion, will satisfy me and many other Doctor Who fans. One of the best things to take away from the Halloween apocalypse is the introduction of Dan Lewis. Every scene he's in, I really love this character, and I think John Bishop is perfect for the role. He seems like a nice guy. For instance, little things like offering sweets to the trick-or-treaters is heartwarming. He's also someone who's too proud to the point that he's too selfless because he's a guy who isn't exactly living the best of life. He gives a talk in the Liverpool Museum and he doesn't even work there. His house is almost empty with no food left. This guy is clearly making me sad because he seems like a really nice guy but he's struggling. Yet this can all change as the Doctor and Yaz become part of his life after they rescue him from Carvinista. Gotta say, I love the scenes between Dan and Carvinista. Also, I like how Dan gets acquainted with the Doctor and Yaz in a very frantic manner. And to be honest, it just sums up the whole episode. This episode is frantic. Not the conventional way to introduce a companion, but in context of this particular episode, I think it works surprisingly well. Now, for the big bad in this, the swarm. Upon first viewing, was anyone else reminding of Lord Voldemort? At this point, we don't know that much about this guy, who he is, or who his female companion is, but once again, the makeup team did an outstanding job. These two aliens are just great in terms of design, and they look powerful. I can't wait to see how the Doctor is connected to them. Another highlight is the Weeping Angel scene. Honestly, this is the best they've been handled in a very, very long time because I think they've been criminally wasted in other stories. The way it was directed and the way it was acted, brilliant. Also, who on earth is this Claire? She knows the Doctor, but the Doctor doesn't know her. My theory is it ties to the Weeping Angel subplot as Claire seems to recognise them. While I'm at it, a few things that I find to be underdeveloped and I'm sure that they'll be developed further in other chapters is the stuff happening in 1820. Like, what the hell is all this stuff about? I'm dying to know 
how this links to all of the rest of the story because we literally had one quick scene and it just felt so out of place just after the title sequence where we have this character Williamson talking about this cataclysm which could only be a reference to the conclusion of this episode the same can be said about Jacob Anderson's character Vinder he works at this observation outpost in space and one thing that I didn't notice on the first viewing but notice on the second viewing is that this observation outpost happens to have the name Rose to be honest, I don't even know how I didn't notice that on the first watch, because it's right there in your face. Vinda was a character who I felt was very underplayed, but I'm pretty sure that we're going to see much more of him through the remainder of the series. And another character who I thought was underplayed, but I really liked, was Diane, who was a potential love interest of Dan, because she knows Dan, she's the one who appears in the museum, and she later finds herself in this dire situation with the swarm, and I think there is much more to her character than what we've seen. The flux is eating away at time and space, the universe is collapsing, and words cannot describe how visually breathtaking the special effects looked in the final scene. In fact, across the board, I say pretty much it was pretty spectacular. From the pre title scene, the swarm's renewal, the transition between the TARDIS and Psychic Link to the Swarm and Dan's house shrinking. It's all there. To add to this, the set designers have done a masterful job on the sets, including Carvinista's ship and the deformed TARDIS interior with the added police doors. The way that all of this is shot fills me with a sense of dread that the TARDIS is in danger. Not even the best ship in the universe could withstand the force of this flux. The icing on the cake is that Segan Agnola is on fire with his score for this. This one episode features some of his best work and it's perhaps a sign of more great music to come. As a standalone, the Halloween apocalypse features a lot of great moments. It's very pleasing. It's written with an urgency and you don't really have a lot of time to breathe. There's a couple of moments where you do have a little bit of padding and a little bit of exposition, but that's a staple of the Chindle era. There's nothing in this that annoyed me to the core, much like some scenes in series 11 and 12. It's a great way to begin this ambitious story. However, I am worried that this is just a setup and the rest of the series can carry on this pace. I am worried that it will go downhill from here. But fingers crossed, this series can carry on the pace which was set by this episode. I'm very excited to see what happens next. How the Doctor can save the universe from the flux after that amazing cliffhanger. The most exciting aspect is that we will get to see more of the new Sontarans in action. We had a brief scene featuring them in this first chapter. And fingers crossed that chapter 2 delivers with War of the Sontarans. Thank you all for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please leave a like. What did you think of the Halloween apocalypse? Enjoyed the review? Subscribe for more, including my review of the next episode of Doctor Who Flux.